Welcome and a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us here this afternoon at the biggest stage at Online Educa. My name is Maren Deepwell. I'm the Chief Executive of the UK's Association for Learning Technology and I've got the privilege this afternoon to chair a panel discussion with three illustrious guests on higher education strategy, putting learners first. I'm sure this is a topic very close to your own hearts. And today our format will be that each of our three speakers, whom I'll introduce to you in a moment, will speak and give their position for about 15 minutes. We'll have a quick opportunity to ask any quick questions or points of clarifications after each presentation. And then for the remainder of the time, we will want to hear from you and hopefully have a really lively discussion ahead of this evening's big annual debate. Now we're gonna try and keep an eye on the hashtag OEB17, so please do have any questions. Um, you can also post them to us online. Now it is my privilege to introduce our three speakers. And today we're going to hear last from Erna Kotkamp, who is from the TU in Delft, from the Netherlands. Our middle speaker today will be Kay Lipson, Online Education Services in Australia. And we're gonna start and kick off today with Ari Johnson from Reykjavik University in Iceland. So if you could please put your hands together to give Ari a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. So much appreciate being here. Um, what I wanna talk about is the technology revolution, which we are starting right now. We're not on the cusp of it, it's not in the future. We're actually at the starting point of it. And what does it mean for education? What does it mean for us as educators? And what does it mean for the learners? So if we look at the origin of universities, those were, back in the days, elite centers for a very select few to be educated as professionals in society. And those were also the centers for knowledge. Now, universities have moved forwards. And one of the big things that we've seen during the 20th century is the democratization of university education. Universities moved to expand the education, to provide opportunity to more people. They became an important part of the social infrastructure, providing education for teachers, all of the services that we get, in addition to the experts in terms of building up civil society and infrastructures. And of course, the number of students in the universities went from a select few to a fairly sizable portion of our population. Now, the development of the modern university has been a very interesting development. And we've seen huge changes in the 20th century in terms of what's the role of universities in leading research, pushing for innovation, helping the society develop, and last but not least, become a driver in making industry as we know today happen and we only have to look at the information technology revolution to see excellent examples of how universities have been the driver of the technology that we know today. Google came from there. But a lot of universities are still stuck somewhere in the 20th century and some even earlier. The attitude is still, let's take in a few select, preferably the brightest students, let's put them into very strictly defined programs, push knowledge on them, test them very carefully, and if they pass the tests, we hand them a diploma. Now, most universities, of course, and I trust the universities represented in this room, are of course looking at a modern, modern way of providing education to their students. They're thinking about not pushing knowledge, but imparting knowledge, also making sure that the students are capable of utilizing the knowledge, of applying it in the real world that they know how to work in collaborative environments, work, know how to work with people from different fields, know how to work with industry, know how to innovate. And at the end of their tenure at the university, we provide them with a diploma, not as a mark of them having passed a bunch of tests, but the fact that they actually are worthy of our trust to go out into society and do what we expect them to do. The thing is, even though this has been good progress, and we are in a much better place than we were, say, 50 or 100 years ago, we have a real challenge ahead of us. We really must evolve, and we must evolve fast. Because the world is changing. 
The fourth industrial revolution is gathering steam, and we are going to be in the middle of it for the next 10 to 20 years. What's behind it? Artificial intelligence, making machines capable of doing things that we've never dreamed of them being able to do. Connectivity. Everything we have today is connected. Your watches, your smartwatches, your smartphones, all of the sensors that are in this room, everything is connected to one gigantic network that surrounds the world, so there's no problem getting the information that we need, and that leads to the fact that we have big data. We have access to just about all the data that we need to know what's going on with people, with machinery, with the status of the environment, and that allows us to really drive automation. And that's the big change that is happening. Machines can sense, they can gather information, they can use artificial intelligence to make decisions, and they can act on it. That's the automation. This is going to have tremendous impact. In addition to all of this, for us as university people and educators, and with, in the environment of providing know-how, experience, and training to people, we also have access to augmented reality, which completely changes the way in which we should think about not just people learning. Think about what it means for someone to have augmented reality when they're working. Learning anything by heart is dead today. It will be super dead in the future. This is going to have a huge impact on our personal lives. Now, most of you have mobile telephones, iPads, or other machinery that keeps you constantly connected. You probably look, some of you looking at it right now. Everything that you see on your screen is actually driven by computers and algorithms trying to provide you with the information that you want. If you're looking at Facebook, it's up to Facebook algorithm what you see. Same thing goes for most of the other things. What the fourth industrial revolution and the automation means for us is that this goes to our physical lives. So we're going to be riding in self-driving cars, and they're going to do what we want to do. They know a lot about us, and they will optimize and automate our physical world for us. More importantly, it has a huge impact on the economy, a huge impact on the jobs that we see in the future. When the machines are perfectly capable of handling the repetitive, boring jobs, then what happens to the humans? McKinsey has estimated for the European countries that the ratio of automatable jobs today is from 36 to up to about 50% of the jobs in the different countries. Depends a little bit on which country you're talking about. Now, does this mean that a bunch of humans are going to be sitting around, 36 or 50% of them, and doing nothing? No, absolutely not. There's lots of opportunities that comes with this. And we should be celebrating the fact that the machines are going to do the boring stuff, we get to do the fun stuff. Be creative, work together, collaborate, have human contact, etc. But the universities then must keep up. The universities must provide education that fits with this new world. First and foremost, we should be thinking about not the way we were taught when we were young, because that's outdated. We should be thinking about what our learners today need so that they can operate in the future. Should have the econ they should learn for the future economy and society. They should be much more capable of selecting and combining together uh, disciplines, programs, projects, and things that they want to do that they see useful for their future much more flexibility, and finally, we should utilize the technology that we have in order to do this. This is a real challenge. Universities are fundamentally conservative in the way they're thinking. We have structures that have existed for years, everything from the names, the titles that we give to faculty, to the fact that we still talk about courses, lectures, programs, and degrees. All of these are structures that box us in. It is really hard to break out of it with a large organization like a university. So it's not going to be easy, but we have to do it. We have to adapt to this new world. We're going to have to increase the flexibility in our degrees. We're going to have to rethink the way we teach. We're going to have to focus on how do you use the knowledge, not whether you have the knowledge sufficiently well to be able to answer questions on a test. Creativity will be the key, as well as cooperation, collaboration, and human interaction. And finally, we need to teach the students how to connect with society and have real impact. 
Now, every once in a while we hear that the university will die in this new modern world and that we're no need for them anymore. No, they're not going to do. Actually, they're going to play a more important role. But the key thing is, they have to play this role now. It is too late for us if we're going to play this role once the revolution has happened. We have to do it now because we're going to be the drivers that help society move from where we are today to fully embracing and being able to utilize the fourth industrial revolution. Now, universities will change in a great deal and in very many different ways. The students will be different, the technology will be different, the teachers will be different, the demands will be different, and actually our products, the degrees we give, are going to be different from what they are today. So society is changing, the economy is going to turn upside down, our students are going to be changing, but in order to help society move into the new economy, universities play a key role, and if we are going to do our thing for society and for the future, then we have to do it now and we have to change. Thank you. Ari, thank you very much for a really thought-provoking opening. We've got time now for one or two um, quick questions, and then we'll go to our next speaker. So if you do want to ask a quick question directly to Ari, please do raise your hand. And that includes our two fellow panelists as well. So if you wanted to take the opportunity, please do. Um, are there any quick questions? All right, one question that I wanted to put to you is, um, can you leave us with some thoughts? You say university must change. Can you give us a bit of insight into your personal perspective of, of what that future might look like? Uh, be very happy to. So actually, one way to think about this is that um, this should be the frame of mind uh, that you have when you're listening to, to my two co-speakers here. There are a lot of things going on. There are a lot of new advances that are taking place. Universities are moving forward, doing different things, and we have some excellent examples of that here and in other talks in this uh, conference here. My personal view on this is that the key for universities is to break outside of the boxes. We are still educating towards standardized diplomas that were some of them were last reviewed in the middle of the 20th century. Somebody put it this way, this is not my words, this is somebody I was talking to last week in the United States. They said, we still teach all of our students as if they're working for the 1950s structures, machines, society, and economy. But we have to be preparing for them, them for 2050s machines, society, and economy. And for that, we need to let go of a lot of the things that we've taken for granted. And that's hard. Oh, I, I think that's a great um, insight. Thank you very much. And I'm hoping that Kay is ready in a moment um, to share with us her perspective and give us her insights into putting learners first. So please do put your hands together and give Kay a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've come a, quite a long way and I'm um, looking forward to uh, participating in the conference. So I'm going to tell you about a case study, an actual um, uh, uh, an, an initiative that was uh, undertaken in Australia over the last five years. So I guess from Ari's general position, we're moving to, as he said, a fairly specific example. Um, Back in about 2011, in Australia, the government decided that students would be able to get a place at university wherever they chose, so that the places were not allocated to the university, they were allocated to the student, uncapped demand. So instead of having your uh, student numbers enshrined in uh, a limited number of available places at other universities, all of a sudden the government decided, well, it probably wasn't that sudden, um, students could vote with their feet. If they wanted to go there uh, to a particular university and the university would take them, they could do that. And no one was really quite sure how that would work out, but there was always the possibility that all the students would vote with their feet to go somewhere else. And a university felt, universities felt quite vulnerable. Um, the university that is uh, at the heart of this initiative is called Swinburne University of Technology and it's in Melbourne, Australia. It's 
ranked in the top 400 universities of the world, which someone told me today is not that good, but I reckon there's 10,000 universities plus out there, so it's not that bad. Um, but there are very good universities in Melbourne, Australia. The University of Melbourne, Monash University, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, Deakin University, some you might have heard of. Um, not a lot of people have heard of Swinburne. And so, uh, and Swinburne is a small university by Australian standards. At the time, it had 23,000 students. Um, and it doesn't have a medical faculty. It, has, it didn't have a law school. So it's quite, it's a, it comes out of a traditional technology engineering background and has a range of business programs. So there's a vulnerability that comes with a new political position. Um, how do you make sure that you actually are out there competing for students in a competitive environment? Well, the number of school leavers that are coming through in uh, Melbourne, Australia at that point in time isn't changing a lot. So it's not as if there's a lot of organic growth in the market that's going to actually allow everybody to grow, although it was amazing the number of universities who said, we will all grow. Um, but if you're going to grow and you're going to be in a competitive environment and you're probably going to have universities who are more uh, desirable to students on basis of reputation and ranking, how are you going to do this? So Swinburne made a decision that they were going to do this by growing through online learning. Now, we already also have in Australia a lot of online and distance education providers. This is not an empty space. So how do you differentiate? Do it quickly. This decision was made in... Uh, late, early 2011 um, for a 2012 intake. You're going to galvanise and you're all of a sudden going to become a differentiated online provider and you're going to meet the needs of those learners and you're going to find those learners. Who are they and how do you find them? So what Swinburne did was they went into a partnership and they went into a partnership with a company called Seek. And Seek is the biggest job board in the world. You might have heard of Monster and some of those other job boards. Seek's actually bigger. They're big in Australia, but they also have bought huge job boards all over the world, so they don't operate in other countries under their own brand. They're located in Melbourne, Australia, and the marriage of the digital innovative company and the reasonably traditional university happened in the beginning, sorry, the middle of 2011, July 2011. The, the, the marriage produced a child, and the child was online education services. And it was a company formed to be a centre of excellence for online learning and to enable Swinburne University of Technology, a brick and mortar university in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, to become a player in the online education. And to do that by launching with their students in March 2012. So in March 2012, they launched with 500 students. And I'll tell you the end of the story a little later. Online education services actually looks after every single aspect of the online student journey from marketing, recruitment, learning design, teaching and learn, teaching, assessment and administration. And they do that all on behalf of the university, external to the university. And the reason it was built external to the university was to meet learner needs, to understand online students as different from the on-campus cohort and to make sure that every service and everything that they experienced was bespoke to the online learner. This is a very difficult thing to, um, Ari talked about sort of redirecting this large machine that is at a university to put its focus somewhere else. This is another strategy, don't try. Just build it somewhere else. Build it from the ground up separately somewhere else. And then you don't have to redirect it, you can just invent it. The students are very, very different. They are students who are coming back to learning from a very different career, sorry, a different, a different um, journey. They're not school leavers. There's a few school leavers, and up there we've got a few examples. I'll keep leaning into the machine, I, the, the, I don't need to, it's on me, hang on. Um, we got Jessica Fox over there, who's a gold medal Olympic Olympian for Australia in rowing. She's been studying psychology online for a few years so she can fit in with her training. It's fairly unusual for us to have, uh, she started with us when she was 19 and that's quite unusual. Um, Adrian has uh, transitioned from a business course to become a teacher. The Tifa has, been, has started her own business um, and has, has taken a, on a business degree because she felt that she needed to get that uh, additional uh, uh, credibility and credential. And Jacinta has changed careers while she's home studying with the family. 
Current student cohort is 74% female, average age is 33. 94%, um, sorry, 80% uh, of them study part-time, very rare to have a full-time student, and 25% rural and regional. And I, I like to put that up because people actually think online students in Australia are online because they can't get to a university. That's absolutely not true. Most of them are in the cities. They're in Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide. They come to university online because they have lives. They have busy lives. They have families, they have jobs, they have demands, and they don't want to travel. They want to fit study into their life. And study has to be flexible. It has to fit into their life. So this is putting learners first means understanding exactly what is the experience those students need and designing for them, not retrofitting an on-campus experience and hoping that they will actually be able to succeed with it. Okay, lots of words up there that you can't read, but the essential point of this is the marketing and how you access these students. These students are not coming through careers teachers at schools. They're not going to careers fairs. They're not actually thinking about how they access higher education in the same way. For some of these students, they don't even know they could go to uni. The actual idea that they would be able to go to university at this age and the stage of their life is absolutely breathtakingly illuminating. And it is such a wonderful thing to be able to enable those learners to take that learning journey that they never thought they'd be able to have. So we do, do a lot of marketing, um, television, radio, digital marketing, a lot of search engine optimization, SEO, SEM. But we also work through our partner Seek, which is a job board. And on a job board, you get a lot of people on a job board. The people on a job board who are looking for jobs are often looking for educational opportunity. And that's the synergy with Seek, and that's what they bring to the equation in terms of that partnership. Learning materials are purpose-built. There is absolutely no concept of my PowerPoint, my PDF, or the videotape of my online lecture as being appropriate learning material for an online student. They must be built around a pedagogic model which is valid in an online environment. We build ours around the social constructivist online model. We leverage a lot from Jilly's work and a lot of work from the Open University. We make sure the materials are engaging and interactive and give students a lot of scaffolding because what we're talking about here are non-traditional students. We're talking about students who perhaps haven't studied for 10 years. So we are taking them on the journey. So we're building, we're giving them a ladder. We're not actually putting a bar and say, jump, jump, how high, jump higher. We're saying, how do we get you there? What's the process that gets you there? Um, and I did, I've just gone past that slide very quickly, but obviously the learning design, the learning materials are a collaboration between the university and, and the online education services. The university is always the curriculum owner and the owner of the intellectual property and they bring the material and the standards and what students need to be able to do and show to be successful. But what we're doing is repurposing. We also recruit, train and manage all the teaching staff. So we go through an extremely, I think I, we probably spend more time recruiting an online tutor than I had spending recruiting professors when I was on the campus. We actually put uh, out advertisements or we get a lot of word of reference. We ask them to fill in an application form. They have to demonstrate the minimum academic qualification required by the, the university. Um, we did have an extensive telephone interview and in the telephone interview we look for passion for students and passion for online learning. Because if students are at the, your heart of what you're trying to do, and if you care about those students, we'll teach you how to do the online facilitation, but we've got to believe in it. So if people sort of come across in their telephone interview is thinking online sort of second rate to on campus, but they need, the, they need the job, we're not probably going to give them a chance. Then we put them in a 25 hour training program online. It goes over three weeks and we pay them to participate. At the end of it, they get a certificate of completion, but they don't necessarily get a job. Because if they don't demonstrate through that that they've got the passion and they've got the, um, the belief in online, then we don't give, make students go through that experience. Some of our tutors say it's the longest interview they've ever done. Um, and then finally, we put them into a class, but we assign them a teaching coach. And that teaching coach travels the journey with them through the first module that they teach checking in with them regularly, looking into their websites, giving them feedback on the way they are interacting with students, making sure that they are encouraging and supportive through that whole journey. 
They have to be online every 24 to 48 hours and they have um, a 1 to 25 ratio in their classes. Oh, sorry, I've got to go back because we actually have an 87% teaching quality rating coming through that. And as well as that, one of the things that we learned from teaching online for a long time, but many years before we went into the company, is that online students don't have, have very, very specific and urgent needs and they don't usually happen between 9 and 5 Monday to Friday because they're actually at work. So what they do is they need help be after hours, Saturdays, Sundays, public holidays, and they need to talk to somebody and they want a real person. It is so important for an online student to speak to somebody, to pick up a phone and know that someone will answer it, or to send an email and get one back, or to do a live chat and speak to somebody. It's so, it's so very important for them to feel that level of support and so we have a team of our student advisors who give that sort of support. They can take over control of their uh, desktop if they need to. So they give technical advice, they give low level, they give pastoral support, they give course advice, and they are actually also able to help students with general academic queries because they're all minimally degree qualified and some of them have master's degrees. So if you ring the phone number, somebody who actually understands your problem will answer it. And how do we make sure that we keep evolving to meet the needs of our learners? Well, we have an extensive analytics and data that sits behind this. So we marry the data from Salesforce, which is the CRM we use to manage all the other student experiences, with the, uh, the, learn the LMS that we're using, with the student portal that we've built, and all of that other data, and it's being married into a big data lake, and on the basis of that, we are running all sorts of interventions with students. We are understanding where students are falling down. We're understanding that, you know, that there is a level of uh, challenge around the technology that we need to, for, for certain students. We, we're getting better and better and more granular at understanding what student problems are and what sort of solutions we can serve out to them. So I'm very mindful of time, but I'm just going to uh, finish with uh, another slide on research. Um, we just did, an, 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 we do the, the data and we drive a lot of the interventions through the, the analytics capability, but we also continuously run research projects. And this is one we did quite recently, which is really an ethnographic study. And we took a group of students from six weeks before they started the teaching period until 12 weeks through the teaching period and we actually watched them as a little micro community for that whole period of time. And these are the questions that we asked, who studies and why. So these are all of the things we uh, looked at on the right hand side. What makes it hard to get started? How do the student, what do the students expect? How do we deliver and what triggers disengagement? And that sort of, um, this particular study led us to some number, and I can't remember now, but it was in the teens, maybe 15 or 16 little research projects, which were then taken forward to help us better understand the student experience. Okay, so this is really my favorite slide, which says, have we been successful? See that blue line? That's what we did. So we went from 0 to 10,000 students in five years. All the other lines are the traditional online providers in Australia, the distance providers. And what we did was basically we blew them out of the water. So a fairly small university in Melbourne took on the larger players in online distance education in Australia through their partnership, through a partnership which facilitated meeting learner needs. And so the message is we can do it. And we can do it by understanding the needs of the learners because the learners are attracted and will be attracted to a, to a product, to a program, to a suite of services which meets their needs over and above perhaps just being attracted to a brand or a ranking in a university. Thank you. Kay, thank you very much. Um, if you do have any immediate questions for Kay, we have a, a moment time to, for you to ask them, so please raise your hand. The stage is quite bright, so hopefully if you're raising your hand, we will actually spot you. Um, but Kay, I was hoping you could maybe expand um, one of the slides. You talked a lot about learners' needs and how they need support 24-7, more or less, and on public holidays. And then you went on to talk about measuring success. In the research that you mentioned, um, 
did you have to rethink how to measure success in this model in contrast to more traditional delivery methods? Could you tell us yes. a little bit more about that? I, it's absolutely a fantastic question because the measures of success I gave you there, there were some um, measures of uh, student skill development, employability, et cetera, et cetera. They're all government external measures. That, that's what we get measured on as terms of success. So that's, I guess, that's one lens. There's another lens, which is how quickly we grew the program and, and how we were able to kind of um, build the student cohort. Um, and that's a, a huge measure of success in terms of the investment of both of the, the parties into that. Um, we actually ourselves find that some of the, these measures are blunt instruments when we actually start talking to students and start looking at students. A student, and a non-traditional student will do a very, sometimes a very checkered journey through a degree. They will come in, they'll do a couple of modules, they might take a, a year off, have a baby, come back, do something else. Now, probably the same student measures three or four times as attrition on our measures over the course of their journey because they actually are just not doing their traditional journey. So one of the things that we are talking a lot to government about Australia and lobbying a lot about is, you know, your measure of success is a pretty blunt instrument. Is it a, if, if, a, if we've got somebody who comes and they study online and they do some, some units and they get promoted and they get their dream job and they decide to just stop, isn't that success? I think it's a great success, but it's not a success from any of those measures. Oh, that is a really interesting perspective. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any hands up, so I think you are all just as keen as I am to... Oh, Anna, <laughs> who would like to answer a question? Please, before we hear from you. <laughs> now, I was wondering, because I was, I was very inspired by your, your talk, and I see a lot of similarities with the university that I'm from, at Delft University of Technology. Um, and you apparently made a decision to put the, the online um, education services outside of the university and Delft made um, the opposite decision. We, we positioned it within our university also to make sure that our whole organization kind of grows with it and all the, the insights that you're also sharing that are similar to ours are fed back also into our campus education. Um, how do you see that for, for Swinburne University? Does it still work that way even though it's positioned more outside of the university? I think it does, and I think it's, it's quite interesting because um, the, universe, the vice chancellor at the time um, called us a, a demanding client because, um, because we wanted to actually have very bespoke and student-centred services um, that a lot of the things that universities do aren't actually built around student experience. So um, <coughs> because we had a, a, an organisation that, that had people from industry as well as from, as from universities, then the, and they brought a different lens. And, and, and they would often say to me, I came from university background, why do you do that? And I go, mm, why done that? Um, and they, well, it's not very student, it's not a good experience. So even just enrolling a student, you know, on, on campus, a student applies, they offer, they accept, they enroll, you know, why do you do that? For us now, a student rings up, they hang up enrolled. Um, so it's, it's kind of all of these things can be streamlined and processed and made to be very student friendly. In terms of the learning materials, um, we work very closely with the, with the university in, in, the, in the learning design and collaboration of the learning materials, but everything we build belongs to the university too, and, and lecturers and academics can use it in their on-campus teaching, so that there is a, a, quite a flow of information, uh, sorry, resources. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Are there any more questions hiding anywhere? Um, because this was a really interesting beginning of our debate. Um, but now I think we're not going to wait any, any longer for um, our third speaker. And Anna, a um, very warm welcome to you. I think we're going to put our hands together one more time. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Stress about the clicker. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, my talk is a bit more uh, practical and it's actually kind of nicely going into a, a more overall vision to a bit more concrete and very concrete uh, part on my side. Um, I would like to talk about uh, what we did when we had to start with uh, choosing our new, what we call our collaboration and learning environment. Some people call them VLEs or digital learning environments. There are all different kinds of terms. 
we uh, very consciously chose the term collaboration and learning environment. I will get to that in a little bit. And what I think is really um, interesting also, uh, Kay, what you told about, about the online education services, the, um, the way we approached this was actually very much triggered by the need of what, what in our uh, university is called the extension school. So it, it's, it's really nice to see how, how that works. <clears throat> uh, I will very briefly, of course, give up the context of the TU Delft, the project set up for the new environment, how we approach change and implementation, and the first results of the student survey. Because what was the red threat throughout the whole project, of course, was the learner's experience and what our students wanted, our, both our online students and our campus students. The University of Delft has 24,000 students. Only 600 online students. I was impressed with uh, your numbers of online students. That really doesn't match ours yet. We're ambitious. We're hoping to get to, I don't know, 12,000 you, yours was? Wow, that's very impressive. Um, we have eight faculties, uh, about 3,000 courses taught per year, um, 1,800 what we call non-courses, uh, organizations, courses that are a bit more on the fringe of our formal education. 16 bachelor programs, 36 master programs, one educational vision. I think we worked on that for about five years. 19 years of using Blackboard. Uh, we have now 68 MOOCs, massive open online courses run on the edX platform and 29 uh, so-called professional um, educational uh, courses uh, that are run on a separate platform at this moment, but will be moved to our new uh, learning environment the next academic year. Um, we have a, a, a big ambition at TU Delft, and we have a separate program for that and a separate institution, the, the Extension School, that uh, carries out the, the, the vision of, uh, of the whole university that we want to educate the world. As I said, we don't have small ambitions, and we want to improve the quality of our own education. Um, we have different streams for that, um, and uh, the learning environment is, of course, a very uh, important uh, tool or means, whatever, to actually accommodate this. So we were in need for uh, a change in our learning environment, very much coming from uh, uh, that high ambition towards open and online uh, education. The TU Delft also has very big ambitions in, in open education, the use of open educational resources, the reuse of educational resources, uh, for which we needed a different platform, different policy to make sure that uh, that would be uh, supported. But of course, we also have an increasing ambition in improving our campus education. Um, and we needed, of course, to address the changing needs in all the different kinds of education that we would like to offer and, uh, in the end, have a system that would be both flexible but also stable, which, uh, from an IT perspective, is always a bit challenging. Uh, on the one hand, you want flexibility, you want to be able to, to, to plug in neat, you know, um, innovative tools, but on the other hand, you also want to make sure that the environment sta stays stable, uh, is also up to legal code, which is, of course, very much an issue at this moment. Um, so that was quite a challenge to, to, to find something that would uh, uh, support that. And uh, also, I think for a lot of European higher uh, uh, educational institutions, uh, is also the obligation to start an official tender procedure for the use of our learning environment. Um, so what did we do? We started a big project. <clears throat> um, as you can see, we started that uh, over three years ago, uh, with, of course, the establishing of a project plan. You always need a project plan. Uh, but most importantly, what came out of the project plan was the very uh, um, importance of focusing on education. What, what were the needs of students and what would that mean, how we would be able to support our teachers to be able to really help uh, uh, learn our students. Uh, so what we did, we looked at different educational scenarios uh, uh, from a theoretical perspective, but also from the practical perspective, uh, also from the visionary perspective, what is, what, what is already there in a university, but also what would we like it to be there, and everything in between. So basically, we would actually wanted to try to support all the types of education that uh, we, we wanted to offer. Um, we drew up preliminary requirements, and then we started with uh, so-called proof of concepts, uh, where we uh, used uh, a few different learning environments than uh, the ones that we had, uh, and we did uh, pilots and dry runs with them. And the pilots we did in live education. And, and I will talk a little bit more about the outcomes of that, because that and the evaluation of the proof of concept uh, proved to be very important in the whole kind of change of approach to how uh, we would 
uh, look for this new environment. Um, that. <clears throat> we had a big testing and evaluation uh, phase where we did a survey uh, uh, on the use of, of Blackboard. We did pilots, as I said, but dry runs, interviews, surveys amongst our online students. Uh, we had interviews with uh, our, our staff uh, throughout the university. Um, I realize now that I also miss, oh no, interviews with teachers, it's there, good. Uh, and of course, we did desk research, what, what parties are out there, what tools are out there, what environments are out there. Um, and that actually resulted in a, a very clear focus on the educational process and the student experience. Uh, the shift actually from product to the supplier, we were actually not looking really for uh, a product anymore, but more for a supplier that has experience in uh, kind of accommodating our, our yeah, specific wishes and our specific ambitions. So we changed the tender procedure from like a classic tendering procedure uh, to a best value procurement. I will not go into that, but that was a very interesting process. Uh, the, the, the vendors or the suppliers that entered into that can vouch for that. They kind of struggled with that just as we did. But um, what was very important also in that evaluation phase was uh, the results that came out of that for education. Um, what was very interesting, it's, and it's a bit of a classical approach, but uh, the role of the teacher was still very, very crucial, of course, in student satisfaction. Uh, and with the pilots, especially pilots that we did in one uh, course that had about 800 students and different teachers that we used four different environments uh, for that same class to see what the differences would be, and that the communication and interaction with the teacher throughout the course was, was considered actually the most important thing for students. Uh, and what then for teachers was very important, that they, they needed like proactive support for them, both on a technical but also on a didactical pedagogical level. Um, furthermore, what, what was really kind of surprising to us, because we thought we're technical universities and they want really nice innovative tools and they would want us to focus on that, but it was kind of the opposite. And students said, just, just make sure that the basic is, is good, that it's clean, that it's usable, it's recognizable, uh, and that the teacher knows how to, how to use it. We can find a way around it, but make sure that the basis is very important. Um, and then what was also uh, for us a little bit surprising is that uh, what students also emphasize is that the environment should really used, be used for the learning process and not for all the logistics around it. Like where can I find my room, where are my grades, but really make sure that it supports collaboration and it supports learning. Hence the collaboration and learning environment term. Furthermore, um, what was also uh, uh, important for us that uh, the first impression was important of the learning environment, but uh, that the more complex options were still very much appreciated, but only after being comfortable with the environment. So the user friendliness, the initial user friendliness was considered also very important, but also the support of the more complex functions still was very, very important. And the integration of other tools, of course. Uh, but they also turned out to be a bit more complex than expected in order to really support like a nice, seamless uh, uh, learning flow uh, for students. And that's, that's still a challenge for technical, but also for legal reasons. Um, and the other, the, the last result that was very important was the usability on mobile devices. That was not really a surprise, uh, but it was really good that we, we stayed focused uh, on that. So last July, no, not just last July, July before that, we, um, uh, we went through the whole procurement uh, and um, let there be Brightspace. Um, the product is called Brightspace. The uh, supplier is uh, Desire to Learn. They're also here. They're one of the sponsors of this event. I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> Um, but they came out as, as the best partner for us because that wa was what we were still looking for, like a partner to help us uh, uh, achieve our ambitions. Um, and what we did with them uh, is go through the whole process of how do we go about implementing the new environment, how do we go about migration, support, all the, like, the detailed work uh, that is considered actually very important to actually be able to continue uh, to innovate your education. So we set up four different projects. Uh, one very, uh, well, obvious, I would say, uh, but the, of course the technical part, the functional part, uh, migration, but very important also the change in communication part, because with the introduction of a new environment, we also implemented a lot of uh, policy changes, but also very much um, the desire to improve our educational quality with the use of uh, this learning environment. 
So we created a really big team. Um, but the, one, the ones that is most important, especially when it comes to, to putting your learners first, is the, the blue bubble on the right. We had uh, a big central advisory group where uh, representatives from all our faculties uh, uh, took part in. And there were both teachers, students and staff that came out of faculty project groups. So every faculty had their own project group or advisory group, depending on the faculty, to make sure uh, that their specific needs for their education uh, was being uh, met. And that was fed back into the central advisory group and then back into the project so that we had uh, like a really good yeah, conversation all the time of how, how to go about implementing, how to uh, prioritize certain choices and actually how to set up bright space to, to uh, really uh, make sure that, that everybody felt comfortable with it. So that was our change in implementation um, uh, uh, strategy where we uh, formulated a few uh, premises. One, and of course the important one was the educational uh, quality uh, improvement uh, uh, and a few more practical ones. I'm looking at the time and I think I have to speed up a little. Uh, the other goals and starting points came out of the, uh, the pilots and the dry runs and, and all the testing that we did What was of course not use the learning environment as a portal. Uh, also really cleaning up the content of the past 17 to 18, uh, 19 years. So we did no automatic migration. We just started completely with a clean slate. Uh, and of course the student experience uh, as being crucial, but with kind of the idea that less is more. So a more structured way of setting up courses, less actually flexibility for teachers to change some components. That was hard. Uh, the importance of mobile and offline use for also our students that go abroad and are not always um, uh, do not always have access to uh, uh, the internet or a reliable internet, um, and also the idea that quality and innovation is sometimes really in the details and not in the big visions. That of course part of it and triggered it, but in in the execution of it, details are very important. And of course, the involvement of uh, 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 faculty, faculty, students, teachers, uh, pretty much everybody who wanted to, to uh, have a say in, in how we would do it was, was really welcomed into to, yeah, starting to, to, to discuss that with us. And we ended up with a two-stage migration, uh, also with the idea that details and, and a solid base is very important to, to continue your innovation from. So the first year, and that is the year that we're in now, is very basic. Uh, focus on migrating all the courses, uh, making sure uh, that all co courses will be using the same very basic structure for, for uh, information without trying to diminish the flexibility that a teacher wants and, and, and um, how would you say that the, the, the control that the teacher of course is in, in setting up his course, but also to accommodate the wish of the students to make sure that we have a basic structure so that it's easier for them to kind of know where to find their information. And the second year, that's the next year that we're all looking very much forward to. We can finally like go ahead and do really the, the, the interesting, uh, uh, innovative stuff. And uh, D2L with, with Brightspace uh, is really helping us with, with thinking through that and looking at what to prioritize and how to, how to implement certain functionalities or how to roll out certain functionalities and how to make sure that teachers are actually uh, comfortable with that. So that's um, extremely helpful. Um, what we did very, very quickly, um, that the change also in the, 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 uh, the in setting up the basis, we uh, had some, some elements that we decided upon that were kind of fixed and not um, actually open for change. Uh, and those were uh, a few different aspects that Brightspace offers where you can uh, set certain um, functionalities. Keep it very short. Just a few example, uh, the homepage of the course. Uh, the content of the course from the teacher perspective. It doesn't look very sexy, we know. We're still working on it. Um, the perspective from uh, uh, the student. Um, we made uh, templates for, the co for content that it's all a bit similar in layout that teachers can very easily choose from um, and that they can edit themselves. If they want to deviate from that, that's fine, but we wanted to make it as easy uh, as possible. We also uh, uh, gave a lot of support, and we're still giving a lot of support, because uh, and support is really trained also into supporting teachers with, with the vision that we have on first the basis and then uh, uh, the innovation. So we're already collecting wishes and, and, and 
uh, uh, a request from, from teachers on, on how to innovate their courses, how to improve their courses, to make sure that next year we can go off with a flying start and, and really make sure that next year we, we are really getting into the, um, uh, the change that we're, um, uh, we would really like to happen. We did a very, very brief um, uh, uh, student survey to, to check how, how happy they were, um, which was actually not bad. Of course, next year we expect it to be much better. Um, but, but coming from also that students sometimes are more conservative than we thought, that uh, especially the, the, the older year students were a bit less happy with uh, how we set it up than the first year students. The first year students were actually more on the, the, four, the fourth and the fifth smiley. Um, and the older year students were more between the third and the fourth, which is actually, uh, we were happy with it because change is also always a little hard. Uh, so after a few years, a few uh, months of using Brightspace, this, uh, we were actually very um, pleased with it. And also to make sure how, how basic actually their feedback was. Um, we had two other questions. What would be the first thing you would like to change about Brightspace? Um, very basic, not, not you know, big things that we had expected, or this is not working, or that should be better. It's very um, basic things that we can actually easily change, and it's more a policy change that it has to do with Brightspace. So that for us was also kind of comforting that the things they wanted to change were actually the things that we thought might be better. Um, and also what they liked about Brightspace, that made us very happy. They liked the interface, the ease of use, uh, the similar setup of the courses. So that what was collected on input before we started uh, implementing it was actually working. Students were happy, are happy with it. And of course, uh, the mobile use, they're very um, satisfied with that. Yay. <laughs> that was it. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Anna. And in a moment, we will turn to you um, for your questions. But I think it would be interesting, given that we have such wonderful contributions from our panelists, to give everyone here the opportunity to maybe add another thought or share with them a provocation of things that you'd like to discuss with the audience or questions. So please do get ready to ask questions and raise your hand. But Anna, maybe if you want to start first, given that you um, uh, that you spoke last. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of what the future will look like? What do you hope in, in year two and beyond? Where do you see it going in five or ten years' time? Well, um, more, oh, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, but, but first, we're, we're going to have to start with uh, making sure that the different types of education that we, we mapped out in the beginning of the project, that they are being fully uh, supported, like, like uh, e-portfolio sharing content with uh, uh, other parties outside of the university. Delft University has a very uh, 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 big relationship with, with uh, different companies outside of the TU that, that our, our students are actually hoping to start working with. So it's really important to be able to support it uh, uh, in a sense that students can, can show their work to uh, those, those prospect uh, uh, employers, uh, but also more collaborative working, like uh, alternatives for, for Google Docs, because I think, I don't know how many, probably everybody here is from Europe, but of course the, the legal uh, ramification of the, 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 uh, the new privacy law um, uh, is going to make it a, a bit challenging for education to... Um, uh, to, to support that better than we would like to, as we do now. So we're really hoping to improve that next year. So that's, those are the two most important aspects, I think. Thank you. That, that's a really interesting perspective. Um, Ari, I was wondering if you, um, you presented a more strategic perspective, I think, in terms of the bigger picture. Now that you've heard from Anna and from Kay what the sort of very practical, um, scaled-up solutions might look like, do, do you have any new thoughts or do you have any perspectives on, on where the debate might go next? So, uh, so it's, uh, you know, in, in the limited time that, that, we, that we have here, um, decided to go with the big picture. We've, of course, at uh, Reykjavik University, we've been doing a number of things to move us in this direction. So we restructure our semester, for example, so that uh, both the fall semester and the spring semester are split into two parts. About 14 weeks are spent on tr kind of the traditional courses. So we're just 20% of the way of actually, you know, revolutionizing it. But the last 20% of the time that the students have is spent on three-week intensive courses where they work 
together on projects, where they work entirely with industry, where they work with international experts, etc. And one of those three-week courses is actually a school-wide mandatory innovation and entrepreneurship course where we mix students from different disciplines and we make them basically start a new company. Um, we've started in the last three years six new degree programs that are entirely driven by industry mm -hmm. and the modern needs of industry, whether it be information management, whether it be innovation in the fishing industry, or it be what everybody desires so much, the crossover between technology and business. You know, technology people that understand business and business people how to turn, know how to turn on a computer and actually operate the technology. With all of this, um, I'll be, you know, uh, I'll admit that we're, we're in the process of, of putting in a new learning management system. And we <laughs> haven't uh, done the development really of the online content and that's something that's on the agenda. But even with all of the new de degree programs, all of the very close interaction we have with the students, with the industry, we're trying the best we can to be very unafraid to change things at the university and we're often driving it with, you know, tough love from above. <laughs> we're still running behind the development of society and economy around us. So really what I'm looking for, you know, what, what I see as the biggest challenge is how do we bring all of this together? And I think one of the things that can help with that is for universities to collaborate, share experiences, actually work together and uh, maybe do things together to get us there faster because mm. we are running too slowly. Mm. Well, um, okay, I think we have a moment if you have any thoughts to add right now, and then we have our first questions from the audience. Um, did, did you want to make an it's additional point? Or should we go? Please, yeah. um, if you could just wait for the mic to come, and then let us know um, who you are, and tell us your question, please. Hi there. Um, my name's Nick Wilson from uh, the University of Oxford. I had a question for Erna. Um, you had a slide that said um, you had a need to change your learning environment. I was wanting to find out why you had to change from, you felt you had to change from Blackboard after 19 years, and also secondarily, uh, why did you pick, so yeah, t a tender process, why did you pick Brightspace over the other suppliers or products that you considered? Thanks. Okay. Um, well, the need to change had very much to do with, with, I guess, the length of period that we have been using Blackboard. I think we were one of the, the, the early adopters of that. Uh, and the system kind of grew and grew and well I don't know if you usually with IT systems if they grow through use they at a certain point you look at it and like we we need to start over and that was kind of what happened that uh, we've been using Blackboard for so long it was that with a lot of building blocks with a lot of, of, of um, features that we've added ourselves, customizations that almost made it unmanageable. Uh, it did not have anything to do with Blackboard itself as a product, but more with how we set it up. Because also when we started our tender procedure, for us, uh, it was very clear, even though we would, uh, 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 Blackboard would come out of the tender procedure, we would, we would still follow the same path that we would do not an automatic migration, we would uh, actually start all over again and re-implement uh, uh, the environment because we, we, we needed to clean up and we really needed to make sure that the choices that we made throughout the years, we would really, really evaluate them and see if they would still fit with what we needed uh, nowadays. Um, so, and that, and for uh, why Brightspace? And the question would be in, in our sense more why D2L because we really focused on the supplier and, and less on the product with, of course, the, the very big footnote that the product uh, um, should be there. That was one of the requirements of the first phase of our tendering procedure, that only um, suppliers who had a product that already had proven its, um, its value in higher education uh, uh, were allowed to, to go through the second phase, because we really wanted an expert on uh, uh, dealing with uh, a big change in, in this sense, because for us, because we really approached it as an educational project, uh, and it was uh, a change for the whole university. Blackboard was century rolled out, so it was the whole university had to, to, to kind of come with us in this change. Uh, and we needed a partner uh, who knew what that meant and that would, would uh, help us in, in making the right decisions uh, and making sure that we would do it the right way. And that was, that was an important reason. 
Um, and it, I can't really say that much about it because it was a, a non-public uh, tender procedure. Uh, but it, yeah, it had to do with experience, but also that D2L very much showed us in, in uh, the feedback that they gave us to, uh, during the tender procedure that they really understood what our ambition was and also uh, understood where some of the, the uh, how would you say that, the friction within the, the different ambitions that we have would lie that, you know, we wanted to really support almost traditional campus education, but also really uh, uh, new kind of forms of online education and, and everything within it. And they, they, they really showed us that they understood what that would mean. That was an important reason. Thank you. Um, who has the next question? Please do raise your hand and um, the mic will come to you. Right up way there. in the back oh, there. Fantastic, oh, back. <laughs> excellent. Wow. Um, Mike will come to you and we will wait until you're ready to ask your question. It is. Yeah, I have it now. So, hello, my name is Taha, and I'm from the Aal Khan University. Uh, my question is to Erna again. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned uh, cleaning up the old data from 17 years and then starting on a fresh slate. Uh, were there any concerns raised for the research value of the data? Because we were struggling with the same question a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if I, there was a question for me, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, the, the mic is a bit hard to um, Yeah, hear, so I was hear. saying no. that you, yeah, yeah, I'll repeat the question. So you, you mentioned cleaning up 17 years of data from the Blackboard installation that you had, and then starting as a fresh, uh, on a fresh system. So what about like, uh, were there any concerns raised for the research value of that data? Yeah, we, we use Blackboard really for education. I'm not sure if you use with your, your research, like educational research, learning analytics types. Absolutely, so, so, so the, there were student interactions on that learning management system. Uh, faculty had put information over there. I'm sure you had assessments and assignments and all of that. So uh, a lot of institutes see that as uh, potential research avenues. Sorry, I'm not really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so all of the student data and the faculty data that accumulates on the learning management yeah. system over the years, uh, it can be said to have a potential research value. Yeah, but the data is still there. Uh, we, we have a, uh, a self-hosting version of Blackboard uh, and the, the data remains there. But to be honest, up until two years ago, we did not really do anything uh, much with that data anyway. And uh, the way we set up Blackboard, it was also really hard to get out the data for meaningful research. So that is also something that, that with, with the introduction of Brightspace uh, is very much uh, there at the beginning of the implementation is, is especially that question. Like we need to make sure that uh, we, uh, we, we generate uh, useful data with it to, to, to improve also our, our educational quality to use that data actually. So I, I wonder whether, um, I know we're talking in quite a lot of depth right now about the sort of um, technical side of managing change yeah. and scaling up change. And Kay, I was wondering if, if you had any comments given that you've overseen such a large change project and I'm sure um, that, that took some doing, particularly to the beginning. Do you have any reflection on, on what it takes to make these decisions happen, to make this kind of change happen for learners? It needs tremendous buy-in at the top. <laughs> and it needs courage um, uh, to leap out and to actually to, to take the chance. And it needs the circumstances to be right. And they were for us at that point in time because that enabled us to actually enrol as many students as we could. Um, and uh, in Australia, students are subsidised by the government in their studies. Um, so a proportion of their fees are uh, a grant to the university and the rest of their fees are a loan to the student, which is not repaid until they are um, earning a certain minimum salary. So students kind of think that looks like free, um, but it's not really, but it doesn't, but it, financial circumstances do not stop you going to university. So um, in that, that, you need an environment where, where all of that can play out. And, and there's, there's a bit of luck, but there's also the, the skill to recognise the environment. And, and, and see that for the opportunity is, and then um, you need to take the leap. But it needs tremendous buy-in at the top of the university, it needs some tremendous advocates throughout the university. Um, and I will not say it's seamless, 
because I think that, that there is quite, you know, it's, it's, it's quite confronting for an academic to be put in a position where uh, a, a relative stranger comes along and says, well, just tell me about your course and, and give me your learning materials and I'll just go and build it somewhere else and you won't teach it. Um, and so that, that has to be built over time and that took time. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for uh, maybe one or possibly two more questions. Are there any more questions in the room? Otherwise, I think, um, yep, one there. over here. Fantastic. Yes, please. The mic's just coming to you. Uh, thank you so much. My question goes to, K to Kay. I loved your presentation. And I basically have four brief questions. Uh, one of them is that, uh, can you share with us uh, what do you have as policies that you have put in place to support online education? And then two, in case there are any challenges, can you share with us? Then while you're presenting, you didn't talk about uh, what learning platform you're using, uh, maybe to basically help us learn. Why? Because uh, we started online learning, I think, in 2011. However, we haven't got the numbers. I think uh, we are still less than 500 students. So I was wondering, what's the trick? What's the issue here that we are not moving ahead uh, based on your presentation? But thank you so much. We learned a lot. I, I'm not sure that I'll remember all those questions, but I have, okay. remember the last one, which is what's the, what's the key to actually scaling the students? Is yes, that, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, that's really about the, the, the accessing the students through the, through the channels where potential students, finding the students where they're at, which for us has been going to access them through the job boards, through the, the places where they're looking for information um, and, and a very proactive marketing strategy. So um, th this, it's a considerable investment in, in acquiring students, but also it's very much about understanding what the value proposition is to the student and what's going to engage them. So um, in fact, the, the tagline we have for our marketing campaign is we'll see you through. And that was market tested extensively before we actually went with that, because one of the biggest concerns for the online student was the support and who would be there to help them. How, how was they going to get through that journey? It was a big, it's a long journey for most of the students. If they're starting out as a part-time student, then they're going to take at least four years. So you've got to really, really be committed to this. Um, and so that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the lever and that's, that's what we kind of know reaches those students and gives them that confidence that they're going to be um, supported right through their journey. Sorry, what was the first question? Um, I think that okay. was... Okay, um, the other question, can I just maybe mention it? Uh, because uh, before we started uh, online learning, we are told to come up with like some policies like oh, yeah. online, online learning policy, techno-enabled techno policy, and so many policies. What do you people have in place to enable that type of growth? That was the question. Are you talking about student policy or the university? I'm not, I mean, in terms of, sorry, student policies? Yes. What do you, okay, the question is that uh, before you start to be like online learning, in the case of maybe the African context, you must have some policies in place. Uh, one of them that we have in place is uh, online, online learning policy. Then one we are trying to come up with is like uh, education technology uh, policy. So my question is, what do you have in place as policy to support the online learning environment in the concept of university? Um, I'm not completely sure that we have anything in place that's, that's okay. specific to online. Yeah. Um, we recognize the students as very much students of the university and, and every, everything, every um, service, every opportunity that, that is that's given to those students should also be given to the online students. So I think we have one overarching belief and which is that we want these students to be successful, that everything we do should be student centric and should meet the needs of students. In which case that we will be very, we'll, we'll, we will be very tenacious in making sure, I mean, and I, I'm sure you'll identify with this, but in the very early days, one of our students from Queensland rang the university and said they wanted to amend their enrolment and the person on the phone said, you'll have to come to, you know, room 27 at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they did. They got on an aeroplane and they flew because that was what they were told. Now, that can't happen twice. So what you've got to actually do is understand how to actually service those students, how to give them the information which is very, 
very per, uh, appropriate for them, but we also have to make sure that the rest of the university, the campus-based university, understands that this is a different cohort of students with different needs, and that's how they are, and they they need to be managed in a way that is appropriate for them, mm -hmm. and everything has to be designed in a way that's appropriate for them. So, um, I think probably in in terms of the policies, the processes, everything, it just took time. It, it took time to work our way through all of those things and make sure that they met the needs of online students because originally there was a lot of things that happened on paper forms and in rooms that had to be unpacked. So it's quite an extensive process, but you can get there and you can do it quite quickly. You just don't, sit, don't, wait till, don't wait till it's done to start. Do it, on, do it in an agile way. Every time your form comes up that's not the right form, get it fixed. Oh, thank you very much for that question. And I think we're nearly at the end of the time. So in a moment, I'm going to ask all of our three contributors for maybe a last takeaway thought for you. Um, but I hope very much that we're all available for follow-up conversations for the rest of today. Um, and hopefully this debate has helped inspire you for the rest of the conference as well. But Ari, maybe starting with you, do you have a, a, a snappy takeaway for our audience? What, um, what will it take to put learners first in the future in higher education? <laughs> Courage. Um, I think that's the, that's the biggest element that we need. The dis decisions need to be made. They are not always going to be popular within the institutions. They're sometimes going against the environment that we were brought up in. When we were learning, they're going to go a different way. And it really takes courage to move forward, make changes, use the opportunities as have been mentioned here and actually step outside of the boundary that we've always been told that we should be within. If we do have that courage, then we will be successful. I, 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 think, it, I think I'm the brave, I go the brave thing too. And I think, and, and be prepared to kind of, you know, fail modestly, but keep going. I mean, we didn't get everything right every time, as I've just told you about that poor student who flew from Queensland. But I think my, my real other big takeaway is to actually listen to your students. If you want to put learners first, you've really got to understand what their needs are. And I can't overestimate how important it is to talk to students, listen to students and recognise them, the differences between students, the difference between cohorts of students and, and the very changing nature of students over time. So as, as the world changes and technology changes, students change too. So we need to listen to them a whole lot when we're designing their learning. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Uh, and I think uh, apart from, from, from courage, also maybe uh, an aspect of fun and, and embrace the change and yeah, m make, it, make it fun. Well, on this hopeful note, um, I am really pleased that we've put the world to rights and put students first um, in the future for higher education. And I'd like to thank you all very much for participating. I'm sure you're looking forward to this evening's debate. But for now, please show your appreciation for our three wonderful speakers today.